Welcome in episode 331 of the Sources Day podcast, your go-to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very excited to be joined. Once again, it's kind of like a little uh, a little proof when we get the name, the myth, the legend, Stephen Peak, KSR videographer, extraordinaire. Uh, Stephen, it's been a very emotional week. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great right now. Uh, fired up. That was something else on Sunday. Uh, as we as we lose Jack, we'll get him right back. But uh, it, it was probably one of the I, as I told people, this was like a top, probably top five all time experience as a Kentucky fan. What I saw on Sunday, uh, that experience was unlike anything I've experienced off the court. I mean, that's a top five Kentucky memory all time, and I, like. I don't know. I've, I've tried to like figure out why it was so emotional for some people. I don't know if it was the nostalgia of seeing all those players, those past players, and, and more specifically those '90s players come off the bus. But as I just kind of I scanned the crowd, there were so many grown men with tears in their eyes. Uh, just and it's it's so weird, man. We just lost to Oakland like 30 days ago. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it's crazy. I. I, I can't even believe like a week ago right now we were looking at Scott Drew at a Mexican restaurant and trying <laughs> to di dissect what episode of Family Feud he, he was watching. Like that was a week ago. And now we're here. Like it's not even just like, oh, we finalized our candidate. We're looking at, you know, we're not just all in. We're we couldn't be further in with this. And uh it was it was a really cool moment because I brought my six month old son to Rupp Arena for the very first time. And Steven, it was, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I, you know, I just thought it was going to be a cool opportunity. I knew that it was going to be a packed crowd. Um, so I wanted to take him and kind of experience something like that for the first time with me. And we went, uh, it was me, Katie, my wife and, and the baby. Um, we all kind of walked in together. I went down to the media, Katie and the baby went up to the top level where we sit for media in the little hockey press box. And as the crowd kind of kept filling and filling and filling and they added new sections, they started out with six sections. I don't know what Rupp Arena was thinking, but they started out with six and it just slowly but surely grew and they had to, you know, kind of open the ropes to everything and the entire, you know, first it was kind of the first half of Rupp Arena that was filled uh, from top to bottom. And then they kind of opened it laterally all the way until we kind of got all the way around. And then when we got behind the, the stage and all that stuff, they took down the, the barrier. And so it was, it, it ended up being a full 360 degrees and just watching all of that unfold and, knowing that my little man was there to witness all of it with, you know, I wasn't sitting there with him for it, but he was with, with my wife. And then, you know, as the bus came in and as this, the intro video was played and all of those things, like I got teary eyed, like I, I genuinely got teary eyed thinking, I can't believe that I get to witness this with my son for the first time. Mm -hmm. It just, it felt like a larger than life experience that we will all remember for the rest of our lives. And I know that you got to share that moment with your dad as well. Uh, it, it just felt bigger than basketball. I, I was talking to a lot of people down there uh, on the floor. It felt, it didn't, you know, we've, we've seen crowds, Stephen, that were as packed. We've seen mm -hmm. them get excited for the Tennessee game and the Auburn game and the Alabama game and, you know, Big Z's big moment. And, you know, we, we've had those individual pops and experiences but for the first time it felt like everybody in that crowd was there for a different reason like it wasn't hey let's just go kick tennessee's ass it was hey <laughs> we are all in this brand new journey together you know 10 toes on the pavement let's just let's let's just make this happen let's roll and it, it, that 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 feeling of togetherness was something that i i will remember truly for the rest of my life Steve. yeah uh, and, and again, I'm trying to put into words what this meant for Kentucky fans. And, and I definitely don't want to make this a um, a bashing of Calipari. I mean, I, again, I'll reiterate this. Calipari brought so many great memories uh, to Kentucky fans for me personally. I mean, there's a Calipari poster hanging up uh, in my office over there. Uh, I, and I'm still very grateful for everything that, that Cal did. But I did feel like this was a sort of taking back of the program. Like the fans, 
the passionate fans who for who would support the team no, no matter who's on the team. You know, we're we're pulling for laundry. We know that, but there was something that was lost. There was we needed Calipari. We did. In 2009, Kentucky basketball was in a bad place, and we had to go and get wins right away. We had to be a championship caliber team right away, and Cal was the guy to do that. But maybe not for me necessarily, but just from talking to people, I sort of got the idea that they had felt like we had sort of sold our soul for one championship. That we we said, fine, no more traditions, no more senior night, no more Kentucky, uh, tra- the tradition that Kentucky brings to college basketball. We don't care about you know having guys stick around. We don't care if he, they even like Lexington. If they're ready to leave after four months, that's fine as long as they bring us titles. Well, then they stopped bringing us titles and fans started being like, okay, what are we getting out of this deal? All these kids are leaving. And we're going to have one and dones. It's Kentucky. You're going to attract good talent. I'm sure there will be at least a few in the Mark Pope era. If he lasts, if he goes five years on his contract, I'm sure there'll be a couple. But I certainly felt like there was a reclaiming of the tradition, and we'll see how that ends up playing out. But I, I do, I do think there was a little bit of that, especially towards the end when the the deal was all right. You guys get to go to the NBA after winning a bunch of games for Kentucky. When that started to feel like when guys just didn't play at all and took a Porsche deal or quit on the team halfway through the season, or, uh, you know, some guys are just, you know, they, they play for a few games and they're, and they leave and you never really hear from them again. You know, we kind of felt like we were getting the raw end of the deal. And so that was just a sort of exercising of all of that. And I'll tell you another thing that the, the pop that Matt Jones got told me that that was a very KSR heavy crowd and it would behoove the athletic department to have a relationship with KSR. There was a lot of that, man. It, it felt very <laughs> calculated with everything that came out of Mark Pope. I mean, shoot, starting with Mitch Barnhart. When Mitch Barnhart started talking and saying that we had to get back to our roots. I mean, shoot, when M- Mitch Barnhart went on KSR th- it, shortly after it went public, that the announcement went public, saying that we lost our emotional identity as a fan base, that we lost the the connection and the passion that we had with each other, the camaraderie with one another for, as you said, kind of like we sold our soul to something bigger than Kentucky basketball, which is fine because it led to a lot of amazing moments, but that also kind of overshadowed what makes this program beautiful. And we kind of got that encapsulated in a sold out 16,000 person crowd at Rupp Arena that would have, I mean, it was 5,000 people turned away. It would have sold out even at max capacity. Uh, And there were so many of those touch points, talking points, when Mitch Barnhart talked saying, you know, we we lost the heartbeat of this program. And now we it was my job to get that back. And then Mark Pope going through the checklist. Oh, my gosh. I mean, every little thing that Kentucky fans have griped about over the Cal era, the Maui Invitational, home and homes with Rick (laughs) Pitino. SEC tournament. We're not just here to hang championship banners. We're also here to hang SEC championship banners and win the league and, you know, win the things that matter to this fan base. He said, this isn't my program. This isn't the administration's program. It's not just the players program. This is our program. And that was something that I think has just been overshadowed that it did kind of turn into an NBA development league and, you know, station at a Lexington, which is, mm-hmm. it, it served its purpose, but that purpose, it, it, it was no longer there. Like it, it got to the point where, as you said, when the winning didn't, kind of make it acceptable. We're like, okay, well, we'll live with it as long as we keep as with the winning stopping, then we kind of lost track of all that. So um, what was your favorite talking point that Pope brought up? Was it the, you know, was it the SEC tournament? Was it Maui? Was it offensive identity, you know, going back to the analytics and being forward thinking and, 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 you know, progressive in the game of basketball? Like what what was your favorite talking point of the, the Pope presser? So, I mean, the SEC tournament one is one that stood out, but I think there were the, the top two really for me was one when Kyle Tucker asked him about, you know, uh, I think he asked him about his staff or whatever. And Kyle Tucker has been the guy who's been like, you got to get a GM. Kentucky should get a GM. And then it's, it's like he's been following Kyle Tucker's reporting before he got here. And he immediately brought up the GM and, and Kyle Tucker gave like a little smirk uh, at him. That was one. I, I, I think that's big in this time of NIL transfer portal. That's, that's big that he's entertaining that. And then um, the second one 
was one I think that resonated with a lot of fans. And he said something like the, the uniforms aren't just going to be to clothe them. Like they're going to understand what it means to put a Kentucky uniform on. And, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying. I, I certainly think there were guys in the Calipari era, especially early on, that understood what it meant. And I, you can hear from John Wall to Marcus Cousins and those guys and the way they talk about Kentucky, that wearing that jersey, even if it was just for like 40 games for their entire career, it meant something to them. It, even if it didn't mean everything to them at the time, it meant something to them, at least in hindsight. But that is something that I think Kentucky fans, look, even if you got to fake it, <laughs> I mean, we want to believe that you're here because you love us too. Because we, you know, as Kentucky fans, and you know, we're going to show love to all the, to all those players. You, you put a Kentucky uniform on, and uh, aside from the crazy people that DM players, um, most fans are, are going to love you, and you will never have to buy a meal in Lexington when you leave here ever again. You know, there's that's the that's what we give, and we just want a little bit of that reciprocated. And it felt like the last few years it was not being reciprocated, and and we're and and then we're kind of okay with it if you're winning but if you're if we don't feel like you guys want to be here and we don't feel like the coach even wants to be here i mean that that was the other thing too mark pope if everybody in that building wanted to be there how many press conferences did did john calipari not want to be at and you could tell besides all of them but uh, yeah i mean we yeah. heard we heard going into the ncaa tournament that john calipari said somebody asked what's your least favorite part of the ncaa tournament and he says these media obligations it's like yeah, we get it. But can you at least pretend like can you at least try to be one of us for for just one minute? And that's what it, it felt like Mark Pope was one of us. Just the go big blue chant, the, the C-A-T-S, cats, 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 him just kind of taking a step back and soaking it all in going, man, the last time I was in this venue at this type of level, max capacity of feeling it was when I walked off the bus carrying the you know, the 1996 national championship trophy and you know hearing the roar from them the first time around so you could kind of you got the nostalgia but it was also a sense of you know he he just had so many unbelievable quotes about just i know what it means to to carry this tradition forward i know what it means because i was i i was part of the tradition now i know what it takes to get there. And th th those types of talking points were just so important. And, and you mm -hmm. know, this is a guy that you truly felt that once that, pre as, as he was talking, that this was a guy that would crawl over glass to be the head coach at Kentucky. And I think that goes a long way with this fan base. They want to have somebody that cares like you, Steven. Like, I think you are the perfect <laughs> example of, we need to have somebody that lashes out in the same way and feels as passionate and has the same hurt and pain that Stephen Peake does after games. <laughs> yeah, that's I kind of said that uh, before, uh, in the last few years on a Cal because I certainly think when Cal appear and I, and I know I'm reading the, the chat here and the you know the Cal bashing and all that and I'm I'm certainly not trying to to do that. It's hard though to see what happened on Sunday and not have a juxtaposition against what Calipari had been delivering the last few years because if we were to compare this from the Calipari of 2009 when he went up uh, uh, when he was on that stage with the teleprompters and said something to the effect of uh, my vision is one of celebrations and banquets diplomas and banners and Pikeville to Paducah and all that stuff Cal was another guy who I think would have crawled to Lexington to have that job now it's just he had it for 15, he had it for 15 years. Like you can't have that same, you can't go, oh my God, this is amazing every day for 15 years. So, like, I don't want to say that I'm just hating on on Calipari and acting like he just he didn't care about Kentucky and he didn't care about winning. I I I certainly think that he did. But I, I saw somebody put it in the chat here. They said, like, it did feel like this sort of became Calipari's program. And Mark Pope to say the words, this is our program, this is our team. This is the Commonwealth's team. And it's the one thing, it's one of those things that Kentuckians can point out to and with pride. And I think the other thing too, Jack, and I know you're going to bring on Matt Sack and you guys are going to get into some recruiting and, and stuff that's a little bit more important. But I, but I just wanted to say that that crowd was the true Big Blue Nation. There are, I would love it if just once, just the exhibition game, whatever, let's open the doors and let's just first come, first serve it. And let's just see, because I appreciate everybody in those lower levels and the, during the games, we make fun of them. They donate a lot to the program. So I'm not hating on them. You know, we need them. So if that's what they, if that's what they get in return as a front row seat, that's fine. 
But just because that crowd, I mean, if we can get that for a game, I don't know if I've ever seen Rupp Arena like that for a game. So um, all in all, just an incredible uh, few days. Excited to hear about here in the next few minutes what we're working with in the transfer portal because that's just – have you slept in the last few days? I'm sleeping a lot better than I did last week. Like last week was rough, man. I, I, I it, All the days were running together, phone call. Like it, it got really, really bad. So now you're at least like – getting some type of grasp about what we're dealing with here and philosophies and some of those, like this more the the specifics, which I'm cool with. I, I can rock with that, but just the big picture stuff. I'm just so glad to kind of have behind us. And uh, it, it's been a lot. I'm, I'm excited that we're officially kind of turning the page and folk like uh, Pope went on sports center this afternoon. And I thought he had a great quote where he was asked about replacing John Calipari and like the, the shoes that he has to fill. And he worded it very nicely and said, look, you don't replace John Wooden. Like that he said in his head, like that's kind of the running joke in coaching circles. You never want to be the guy to replace John Wooden. And that's kind of a similar vibe of this, you know, I'm replacing this larger than life guy that meant so much to this community and this program that did so much good. He said, look, he revolutionized recruiting. He revolutionized a, a very specific style of play that you really can't recreate. Like he is one of a kind, better or worse. He is John Calipari and you can't do that. And he said, so I want to continue the tradition of chasing championships the way he tried and, you know, did in 2012 and got close several other times, he came up short in the last four years. But the way the investment was let's push all of our chips in on national champions. I want to re I want to try to have the same mindset, but we're also moving po forward as a program and we're going to prioritize the things that we want to prioritize, build rosters our own way. I thought, you know, he keeps bringing up fit and guys that want to be here for the front of the Jersey and not the back and, you know, different things like that. He, he wants to continue the winning trajectory of the program without, you know, kind of, uh, he doesn't want to, overstep his position like he doesn't he doesn't want to he knows he's replacing a legend he doesn't want to minimize what cal has done while also saying it was time for a fresh start and i'm excited to be the be the be a part a big portion of that i i really have liked his messaging since then yeah and um you know i'm, I'm really interested to see how his first team's gonna gonna look and i'm also interested to see you know what the uh what the response will from fans will be going forward. You know, I mean, he's going to lose a game. He's going to lose more than one game. Uh, and I, I, I'm also curious as we, you know, we, once we figure out what the roster looks like, we can kind of get into this more, but like, I, I would like to know how much patience fans are going to have. Um, we're now on some, some droughts now that, that <laughs> there's a, there's a little pressure coming in we always knew whoever's going to come in they're they're inheriting a program that like cal didn't cal left this program in a pretty decent shape i mean unfortunately the way the transfer portal is the, nobody was gonna, whoever whenever cal left there was not going to be a roster um but you know we're now going we're, you know going on nine years without a one seed or we've gone nine years we're, we're going on 10 years without a one seed we've gone on you know since 2015 we haven't had that we haven't had a one seed or final four since 2015 haven't had an elite eight since 2019. So now like these are, these are gaps that are like, we haven't seen at this university before we have never, we only went six years in between one seats. Once they started seeding teams in 1979, Calipari has delivered the longest streak without a one seed. Now Mark Pope inherits that and it could be a decade. And we've also, we're also about to hit the longest streak without an elite eight. So like that's kind of you know this fan base is hungry they want wins and they want to win right away so that's the other thing i mean i think mark pope has the energy though i think fans will be a little bit little patient but it's kentucky he also said he understands the assignment so you know uh, hopefully he'll he'll understand when when things kind of get you know things kind of get tight well let's uh w without further ado we'll um transition into what that assignment looks like under new head coach mark pope uh steven appreciate you coming on man now we're going to transition into uh you know i've been on your show matt you're you're a blast you guys do a great job over the reps no good podcast so now we want to switch this up and have you come on right now because you're right in the weeds of this alongside me and everybody uh following along that portal season's here and now we have to build a roster and know what that looks like under Mark Pope. So how are you holding up? I know it's been a very emotional week for your, uh, for you as well. Yeah, it's been crazy. Thanks for having me on, Jack. First of all, is my audio coming in okay? You, you sound hear me great. Right? You sound awesome. 
Fantastic. All right. Yeah, I'm doing great. I mean, you guys kind of said everything how I felt with the whole Pope thing. I mean, I was at the event on Sunday and just was absolutely speechless. It's hard to put into words just how cool that was. I mean, you guys were talking about, man, it feels like we got part of like our, our soul back almost. But like all I've ever known was Cal. Like I literally started becoming a fan in 2009. I did not follow college basketball before that. So it felt like I was living 90s era Kentucky basketball for the first time. So for some people, it's nostalgic. For me, this is like the brand new shiny thing. I mean, just to see guys like Mark Pope and I mean, all the other guys on the 96 team that I've never got to see play, it was super cool. And it's got me super excited to see this team play and kind of transitioning from the emotions of, wow, like my favorite coach of all time is gone to, hey, Dan Hurley, Scott Drew, and now Mark Pope. Like, oh, yay, Mark Pope. I, Turns out I do like Mark Pope. Let's go. And now building a roster and just break. Why does news always break at like 10 p.m.? Every time I'm about to go to bed, it's we have a new coach. This guy's going to be our next coach. Um, Cal is doing this. This person is also a new, like, huge target. Like, love what you guys are doing over at KS Board. Can you guys, like, break news at, like, 6 p.m. <laughs> and not at 10 p.m. anymore, please? If it were, were coming out earlier, I would love it because I would be getting more sleep and I wouldn't be up till 2 o'clock in the morning breaking down whatever news it just dropped so it's been exhausting man i'm glad that we're finally here um and get it, getting to actually talk about the nuts and bolts of things and how the roster is being put together and mark pope a big talking point for him is fit he wants to bring in one and dones say you know we're not going to just bring in, this isn't going to be byu east we want to build rosters that fit our style of play and our offensive philosophies but we also want to bring in talent. This is Kentucky. This is not BYU. We need to recruit to Kentucky while finding the right fits for guys that want to be here for the right reason. So uh, the the portal's going absolutely crazy, man. Uh, there's a new name popping up every single second of I've just heard from Mark Pope. Here's you know a, a, a new list of 30 schools that have reached out, including Kentucky. Um, you're a guy that I appreciate for like kind of building these categories of okay well this is a guy that's a must-have he, he's we get we got to do whatever it takes to land him versus eh, i'm not seeing the vision here give me a couple of names that you are you are all in on that you that, that you've seen thus far that you want mark pope to invest his nil re new resources uh time and you know investing in in him being a part of this new fit future of kentucky basketball yeah, it, it is really funny. Like, I, I'm used to just like the Cal guys, and it's like, we've reached out to this five star, and it's like, cool. Like, I've heard about this guy for two to three years. I know what his game is. Like, I've seen him in AAU, um, just events and everything like that. Now we're reaching out to guys, and I'm just like, his first name is great. Like, what is Utah State? Like, I've never heard of this guy before. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm having to, like, every time a new guy enters, it's like, okay, let's go. Let's watch like 10 minutes of film. Let's look at his stats and just, um, just just trying to see like what this guy is all about um so i'm gonna botch a lot of names because again i don't know too much a lot about these guys but the the guy from dayton number one i think that's just absolute mark pope cheat code i mean you give the the best three point like schematic coach the a coin flip shooter a guy that literally shot 50 percent last year i think his name was kobe bria or kobe bray yep love him um uh who, who's the big guy from utah state what uh, I'm pulling it up the, the whole list right now. Uh, oh, we got Jack texted uh, me like yeah, five minutes ago. Great, Do I want to great come Osborne. Wasn't prepared? That's it. Yeah, I, I love him. Um, I saw a little Julius Randall in him, kind of like in a, a different way. Obviously, Julius Randall was going to be a, a top 10 pick and five stars. So comparing apples to oranges, but a, a, a big butt guy that could get in the post and kind of is a little undersized for a center, but is super athletic and handle the ball. Very skilled passer. Again, it just screams Mark Pope center. Um, or you could put him at the four as well. I love the center from Drexel. I, I'm really high on Andre Stoyakovich. Um, I think these are all guys we've reached out to. And, and Jeremy Roach was a guy I'm just like, I need to get past the fact that he's been a Duke guy <laughs> for four years. Um, like, it, I, I'm very excited about this new era of Kentucky basketball, but it's like, oh my gosh, is, is it just going to be a, a, a Duke guy and a bunch of white guys? Like, are we literally turning into Duke <laughs> right now? So it, once I kind of got past that, it's like, all right, this is a four-year guy. He He's played at it, one of the premier schools he's faced top competition he's been to final fours he's won ncaa tournament games 
Um, and he's improved every single year. I think every single one of his stats improved or was a career high last year. Like yep. his most points ever, most assists ever, rebounds, steals, blocks, all, all field goal percentage, three-point percentage, free throw percentage. His turnovers were down. Everything that you want to be was up. I think he shot like 42, 43% from three. I think if you're just looking for like a one-year plug-and-play, new coach, new system, let's just get a guy that we know will have a high floor with a relatively high ceiling as well, Jeremy Roach would do very well at point. So it, it's been really fascinating um, talking to past you know people around past players and some of these recruits that have now decommitted and are likely headed to join John Calipari at Arkansas, but not always. Jaden Quaintance is you know visiting Louisville tomorrow, and and some of these other guys are are exploring all of their options as they should. You know this is a, a brand new uh, a brand new situation for them. Arkansas is not Kentucky, and I think John Calipari is unfortunately learning that the hard way that. It's definitely more of a sell to get guys to Fayetteville versus getting them to Lexington. Took a lot more of a sell to get John Calipari to Fayetteville than he will ever admit publicly. I'm happy to admit publicly now. Um, talking to some people around those folks and after their conversations with Mark Pope, I get the sense that Mark wants to do everything his own way. He will take some of these guys back, the recruits that were signed on for next season, the um, guys that were on this past year's roster. I think they, I think he likes them, but I think that he wants his own thing and he's totally okay with hitting reset completely from start from top to bottom, not bringing in like he is not, over the moon about any of these five-star recruits that are coming in, doing whatever it takes, drooling over to, you know, bringing them in. And I think that's fascinating. I respect it. You know, I, I, I still think that there are fits that he probably should explore a little bit deeper, but the vibe that I get, the sense that I get, and I talked about this on KS board, the sense that I get with Mark Pope is that he is all in on doing things his way and bringing in his guys and not trying to recreate the same John Calipari magic with his guys. It's it's risky because you have talent in hand that you that some of them were very gettable to bring back. That I I get the sense that that's not really his intention. He wants to, he he would he says thanks but no thanks to a lot of these guys. Yeah, I'm not too worried about the freshman class. I was never really high on them. I love Jaden Quaintance, but it's more of the two year game with him. It's like I, I feel like JQ would give you kind of a little less than what you want the first year. But you might have to play him a little bit more than you want or maybe play him at the four when he's really a five and he's 17 years old. How much do you really want to play him? Just the hope that you get a second year out of him, which would be absolutely insane. I, I like Boogie Flan, but that, that's kind of where the list ended for me. What I think is interesting is that, I, again, I don't, I'm not behind the scenes. I don't really know how much of the full court press he's putting on. Jack, how much, how hard is he going in, or how hard did he go in on a guy like Zvonimir? Is he still actively recruiting a do? Because I feel like you look at a guy like Zvonimir, if he played at Utah State last year, for example, and he entered the portal, I feel like that's a guy that Mark Pope would be like, yes, let's go all in on him and need him. So I, I wonder if it's just like a we need a clean slate, all the Cal's guys out, or if there was something there with a, a Zvonimir that maybe we didn't over pursue, or maybe he was just always going to follow Cal anyways. And I think a big part of that was following Cal. And if there was one guy to single out, it was Big Z. It was, you know, from a fit perspective, from a you know schematic sense, like that was the that was the fit. But again, how much of this was personality based? How much, like you know, we heard Mark talk about it during his presser, during his call on radio show, during you know Sports Center today, that we want guys that are here and understand the value of why you're here, what it means to wear a Kentucky uniform, and the conversation about Big Z ever since he got here was that he was a 12-year-old in a seven foot two Croatian body. Like, great kid, means really well, but unbelievably immature that his dream is first and foremost, go to the NBA, whatever it takes to get to the NBA. And how much of this dream of returning for a sophomore year is solely based on being a lottery pick next season, which is the one hangup that I had. I think in a vacuum, he was fascinated with Big Z. He, won't, he wanted to coach Big Z. That's why he had the sit-down meeting with him. But like the rest of these guys, you know, the rest of the meeting, some of the guys he didn't even – reach out to that have already hit the portal that have already, you know, are already exploring their options. He hasn't even called because he knows it's just not even remotely close to a fit of the fits quote unquote, like a, a big Z. I think it came down to, Hey, 
if you want to be here for the right reasons and you want to con- continue what you got started in Lexington, we'll have you. You're clearly a uh, an on paper fit for us in terms of style of play. But if you have dreams of being in the NBA and playing for Coach Cal and him being the only guy that's going to get you there, then that's probably a better fit for you. The, Arkansas is probably the better fit for you, and that's it's risky because you have again you have the guy in hand, but you also want to establish a culture and an identity here that if Big Z doesn't fit that, then Big Z doesn't need to be here. He needs to go to Arkansas. You need to go get guys in the portal that, you know, that's why I'm not liking the, this guy will, is a done deal for Kentucky. If you offer him a million dollars, because that goes completely against what everything Mark Pope said in his lead up, you want to get guys. And again, you're going to have to talk money and it's, it's going to have to be a point, you know, that's today's college basketball world, but it can't just be, Kentucky was the highest bidder for this guy, so you get his services. It has to be some heart in him saying, man, this other school's offering me a million dollars, but you know what? As long as we can be in the same ballpark, Kentucky is my dream. This is where I want to be. I want those types of guys, and I think that's that's the vibe that I'm getting from Mark Pope early uh, of who he's going after. Yeah, absolutely. And you heard his pitch inside Rupp Arena. I mean, for it to be all about Kentucky, for this program to go back to just being about the Commonwealth Kentucky, the the players need to represent that too. What we're watching on the floor, the people that are representing us, they need to fit that as well. And I think that's a big part with this transfer portal thing. Like there's going to be names and they're going to come up and you might like one more than the other. Like as you're watching 10 minute clips or five minute clips on YouTube, it's like, oh, I might like this guy more than this one, but person A might be demanding one mil in NIL and is just like, I'm here for one year and I'm going pro, give me the ball, give me these shots. Where the other one is just like, put me on the team, I'll find my role, I'll do what it needs to take. And if I get the team success, I will take away from that as well. Because like Coach Pope said, there's no greater honor than playing for Kentucky basketball. So it's Again, as someone that doesn't have sources like you, that's not on the inside of these conversations, it's kind of almost like I have to wait. And like, if we kick the tires with someone or don't go as hard on someone, I'm kind of just have to trust. It's like, all right, I, I was happy about Coach Pope. I was super excited about his press conference. I was super excited about his vision. I kind of have to trust him and let it let him see it play out um, and see how it looks on the court before I really make any big judgments. Now, the flip side of this that Coach Pope has to be aware of and know that today this is a brand new level of college basketball. This is, you know, uh, in today's portal and NIL era, kids look for different things. So you do have to find that happy medium and some kickback that I've gotten on my end from other kids that have talked to coach Pope beyond just the, you know, current players and upcoming recruits that some, several of which no longer uh, with the program. Um, They want to see, tangible foundation they they you know there are some guys like high profile kids that everybody is that they're on Kentucky's high level wish list that are considering Kentucky but they don't want to be the first they don't want to be you know right now it's Travis Perry and Colin Chandler two really solid players that will have their role but they don't want to be the first to say all right well I'm diving headfirst in with Mark Pope let's let's you know let's roll so I think it's really really important for Mark right now to go get Jackson Robinson at at BYU an absolute surefire star big big 12 six man of the year go get that guy as a foundational piece that you can kind of use as a recruiting tool to say hey we took this guy that's been bounced around the portal. He's been in the SEC. He came to us in his first year in the Big 12 and was an absolute rock star for us. He saw the vision. You can too. You got to start kind of laying the foundation pieces because right now I've heard that there is con- some con- you know, some concern about like, yeah, I, I like it. I'm, I'm intrigued, but I also don't want to be the first one and be the only one. Like I'm, I'm not going to go to a, a clean slate when there are these other options on my list that are a offering good NIL money that have a nice little core foundation, full coaching staff, you got to finalize that staff. That's a concern to me. I know of one name with certainty that will be on the staff next, next, next season. It's been his right hand man at BYU from day one, followed him from Utah Valley. That is a sure thing. But beyond that, Everything that I've heard beyond that is, well, we're trying with this guy and we're looking to finalize with this guy. And, 
you know, things are a little up in the air here, but we feel good about this guy. And you're hearing these dream scenarios of why not Rajon Rondo? How about John Pelfrey? How about, you know, go from the very top of the list down. You're hearing all these loud, you know, Kenny Payne level rumblings, but how much of that is actual tangible, real information? I think a lot of it is just kind of people putting dreams and it being disguised as reality. It's it, Mark Pope needs to get that staff finalized so these kids know who they're going to be reaching, you know, hearing from when they reach out, what the foundation is going to look like. The idea is really nice, but kids can't be committing to this until they have the foundation set. And I think it starts with uh, getting Jackson Robinson committed, and I think it starts with getting uh, Ali Khalifa at BYU committed right there. I think those are two really nice foundational pieces where you can start selling the vision for next season alongside uh, Colin Chandler and, and Travis Perry. Yeah, I mean, as a huge fan of sources say, I'm just like listening to you talk and you're talking about we need some of these dominoes to start falling. And I'm just like yelling like through my screen. I'm, I'm just used to being the viewer yelling through the screen. It's like, well, Jack, what are the dominoes? When are they going to start falling? You're the guy that's supposed to know this stuff. So it kind of sounds like from an outside perspective, we need some of these unofficial hires that might be kind of getting finalized behind the scenes. We need the, I guess, for it there's like a so much like a seven day waiting period that the job needs to be open for. So I guess we're kind of waiting for that timeline. Then we can officially get the staff. Then maybe we could get a couple of these first BYU guys. And then maybe we go after some of these bigger fish in the portal where, um, you know, your, your Jeremy Roaches, your great Osabors, uh, Cade Tyson, maybe Liam McNeely, a, a freshman. Like uh, to me, is, is that an accurate kind of guess on how we can anticipate things going? And, the, those first couple dominoes we might see by Friday, hopefully, and the next couple maybe early next week. But the whole thing could take two to three weeks, probably. And in, in it's finding the balance because, again, Mark Pope is unbelievably calculated. He is brilliant as a basketball. He he act, he reacts with no emotional baggage. Like that's not a guy that is you know has something happen to him and goes, "Well, shoot, I have to have a response." That's not how he operates. He is a, I have my foundation i have my you know i have my philosophies and core beliefs and i'm going to operate accordingly we're not going to scramble we have a long runway to work with let's just take this one day at a time there are, are still going to be hundreds of people that enter the transfer, transfer portal you have a whole new wave after may 1st of guys who will enter as as grad transfers there is so much more to work with here you know, coaching changes. We still have, I mean, the coaching carousel still is not dying down yet. That always leads to, as we saw, John Calipari landing at Arkansas. Like it always leads to little pieces here. So the fact that we are 72 hours removed from Mark Pope rah rawing the Rupp Arena crowd has no bearing on him loading up a 13 man roster. That's not going to happen. That's not how he operates. But he still has to have the foundation set in terms of personnel to be able to continue to sell the brand and get these staff announcements finalized where these kids know, Oh man, like, all right, we got this offensive genius in, in, you know, his, his BYU assistant, some upper level personnel or, um, you know, analytics guys, guys that were really kind of instrumental in pushing the offensive movement forward with you know how they became the video game offense you know getting some of those brilliant x's and o guys got to go land some high level recruiters you got to go hit a home run on on the recruiting trail that isn't just a retread 1996 guy for nostalgic reasons those the the 16 17 year old kids could not care less about being a 1996 champion you're you can't sell them with with john pelfrey as a you know the, him coming to your living room and saying hey we know what it's like to win a national championship here. It's been, you know, 19, you got to go find somebody that has been doing that right now. So that part is important. And I think that's part of the calculated approach that, that Mark is having. And I think part of the reason some of these names that are coming out, I think they are blown way out of proportion. I think that they are uh, people getting restless and wanting tangible info that doesn't exist yet. I think he is still finalizing different things and coming up with, what that looks like. And I think there's pressure on him to kind of not do all this by himself. He has help. There's a guy that he's working with side by side. It ain't hard to figure out who he is and building out from there. So he, he, he kind of addressed that a little bit on his call in show said that I'm going to build out the core of my 
coaching staff, the guys that I know I trust, and then we're going to build out from there, which I appreciate the, that approach. But he also has, has to do that with his roster too. You got to get your core couple of guys that people can start buying into the the dream that Mark is selling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember texting you a, a couple nights ago, and I was kind of like, whoa, is this assistant coming with this player and this player? I'm, like, <laughs> I'm hearing all these rumors. And you're just like, where are you hearing this? Like, no, that is not happening. Like, do, do not set that as your expectation. So, yeah, from a fan's perspective, again, not someone that's seen all the info, it is kind of just so hard to sort out, like, what is actually going on? What is smoke? And my kind of question to you is, do you think some of the smoke is intentional? Because, I mean, like, you're Kentucky. You have a target and you're back. Like, people are trying to recruit against you. Do you think just throwing some of these names out or even, like, some of these assistance guys is just to cause smoke to maybe give yourself a clearer path to go after the guy you do want? Yeah, and I think that's a part of it. And I think part of it, again, I think some of it is just created out of nothing from fan restless fans and impatient fans. Some of it is – but. Mark Pope and some of his closest confidants, they they operate by the book to almost a fault at times where they are so calculated and so, hey, we got to do things the right way and really build this out. You know, it's they're really recreate building a brand new culture here that they that worked really, really well at BYU. Again, different restrictions, different, I mean, whole different culture and identity out there that they're having to kind of piece together in a different way here, but the same core beliefs of we don't have to skate by and do things sneakily and under the table. And like, they don't have to do that because there is such a tangible sample size of him, them having success at the highest level in the big 12, that that is the dream that they're selling. But it's kind of, it's just finding that happy balance of we you know, we we know what success looks like in the Big 12, but we also need to do things differently at Kentucky and see what that looks like. So uh, I think part of it, th there's some of that at play, but I think a lot of that is, you know, people boosters are talking. Like people that have financial interest in this that are wanting their own narratives out about, hey, this is what our roster is going to look like. This is, you know, the the what that core looks like. But ha trying to have these conversations with the staff that doesn't exist yet right now, it's been really, really difficult on my end because they are not talking. They're not operating that way. This, this, they're trying to do things by the book, and you know, G's work in silence like lasagna, like almost that 2.0 while he lays out the the foundation. So, long form version of that, yes, but not really. If that if that answers your question, sir. Oh, it did. It did enough. The funny <laughs> thing is, I, so a lot of people are definitely more on board with Mark Pope now, but the initial reaction was. Why are we not trying to wait out Willie or Billy Donovan? Like Mark Pope, he could be the ninth guy you call and he'll still say yes. Um, we could have gotten him two, three weeks from now. Imagine doing what we're doing right now in middle of May. Which it was kind of like, again, we've already given Mitch Barnhart a lot of credit for this hire. Some people thought he went too fast. It seems like with everything going on, you kind of almost had to go fast because you also look at who are the people competing with us in all of these portal guys. It's Arkansas, it's St. John's, it's UConn. UConn has won a national championship and lost pretty much their entire starting lineup. You know they're going to reload. You know people are going to take those spots. You know Coach Cal is going to get guys. You know Rick Pitino is going to get guys. If we're not in the mix with them right now, it feels like we could be way behind if we waited two to three weeks. Um, now that we're in the mix, again, it's a lot of the same teams with these same guys, and, and there's like 10, 12 guys that we're currently going after. I mean, they all can't go to other schools. Like, you have to think, just because we're in the mix, we are going to get two to three of them, and they could be the best fits for us. Yeah, it's – a lot of that is, you know, I don't think that they are – they are casting a really wide net right now with these portal guys. There's a reason why we're hearing a new name popping up every single minute. And it's because you have to build out your, your, okay, here's, here is a set of guys that could potentially fit what we're looking for in Lexington. Now it's on us to start ramp up these conversations and see some of the more specific beliefs that they're looking for. Some of the like, what are their wants? Do they are look they looking for a certain dollar figure? What type of role are they expecting? Some of those conversations. So I truly don't think that, you know, there are guys that Pope and his 
very small staff right now, like more than others. But I don't think there's a guy right now, like I don't think there are four or five guys that they're like, oh, we're holding this secret near and dear to our hearts and nobody else is going to find out about it. I genuinely don't think that they're, that they're that far along with any of these guys. And that's why I've been so quiet on the message board publicly on this show about like, Hey, I'd keep a very close eye on fill in the blank recruit because I think a lot of that is posturing. I think a lot of that is on the other side, trying to build a narrative. I think the UK versus John Calipari versus Rick Pitino narrative with Jeremy Roach. I think it's blown out of proportion. I think he's considering Kentucky and I think Kentucky likes him. You know, J- Javon Small, there's some talk like, oh my God, it's a done deal to Kentucky. If they reach that number, you have some pe- conversations with people close to Javon Small and they're like, uh, we like Kentucky, but I mean, we're still very, very early. Like we don't even know enough yet to know whether or not we like Kentucky because it's a brand new staff. We, you know, Javon is Antonio Reeves' cousin. They had conversations with the previous administration, John Calipari and the the Chin Coleman, that entire coaching staff. They, you know, Kentucky was a top contender and then it blew up. Everything that Small knew about what this roster and coaching staff was going to look like has gone poof and is no longer what it was a week ago. So to say that they are just this overwhelming favorite is lying because there's so much more at play to work with that just pieces have to fall first in order to even get to that point. So I think it's going to be a longer process than anybody envisioned. And and I think the impatient fans that, uh, you know, want this news, this tangible, these tangible updates of, we're landing this guy. We're the front runner for this guy. I don't think that stuff is going to come until next week at minimum. Like I think we got uh, beyond some of the BYU guys and we could, you know, start getting some of the core guys and Kentucky's brand will speak for itself and you could see things pick up. But in terms of actual core roster news, I don't think that stuff's going to start until next week when the coaching staff is finalized and some of these kids can see what, what the foundation actually looks like and what they'll be signing up for. Yeah, and I blame Mark Pope for that. I mean, he got me ready to run through a brick wall. (laughs) He gave me one of the most exciting experiences I've ever had in Rupp Arena, and all I want to do is go back into Rupp Arena and watch our players play in there and just go nuts again. I mean, I'm glad he killed the press conference. I'm joking, obviously, but (laughs) it's the normal just like in front of 20 media guys and some boosters, shake hands with Mitch Barnhart, take a couple pictures, whatever. We're probably just like, all right, new staff. We're probably going to have to sit on our hands for a little bit and wait. But he goes out and is like, we're hanging banners. And it's like, <laughs> let's do it. Let's go hang banners. Mark, what's next? How do we How do we go hang banners? And we're just kind of just now twiddling our thumbs and waiting for the point guard that's going to go hang us our next banner or the center that's going to go hang us our next banner. And, we're again, we're hearing guys we've never heard of, and I'm watching their highlights, and I'm like, great Osobor. Like, yes, that's, that's the next – Kentucky National Championship Center. Like, I just want it now. Let's write it down. Let's put it in pen. Let's put it in Sharpie. But like you said, just realistically, that's not the case. As as fans, we take a deep breath. We'll get there. Get through the brick wall we just ran through and (laughs) just move forward. Uh, One more guy I do want to bring up is Liam McNeely because we kind of went through the whole freshman process. But again, it seems like if we get him, that would kind of cap the freshman class at three guys and at least one of them is supposed to be multi-year guys um i i really like him i see the fit for mark pope i see him just kind of being a a blue blood guy it seems like the people that he's reaching out to initially it was indiana who used to be a blue blood and then it, kansas was the smoke and then kentucky's kind of getting in there i just kind of see him being just like a, a star on a team i think he could fit as being the one star freshman on a team with a lot of very good surrounding pieces. So again, you you would need those surrounding pieces to make that pitch to him, but you get a, a really good coach like Mark Pope and you get a bunch of four or five year guys that all shoot the ball, ball well and play the role really well. And then you get a future NBA guy to kind of just piece right in the middle of that. It's kind of like UConn. You have all these four or five year guys and then you have, um, what was it, Stefan Castle that was just like, all right, that's that's your just your young motor that's going to be your little NBA talent that gets you over the hump. I could see that happening. Um, I could see that fit going very well. So here's the interesting thing about Liam McNeely. 
I heard when Kentucky reached when I, I heard randomly that John Calipari was hell bent on landing Liam Liam McNeely after he had already landed the commitments of Billy Richmond and Carter Knox. And it's like you have Sompto, you have Jaden Quaintance, you just added two wings. So there are four three three to five position guys that you already have signed committed or signed on for next season. And now you're hell bent on landing Liam McNeely and the fit just didn't make any sense to me for him to play with that core group, knowing the politics of all that, that we just experienced with guys that are going to play one way or another, no matter what they're playing, their current production indicates. But the interesting thing I heard about Liam McNeely is that he would love to play for a blue blood that he has that in, like he went to Montverde, one at the highest level at Montverde. He wants to, he's a winning kid that values that above dollar figure, above, you know, any of the, you know, playing time role, all that. I mean, it's important. He wants to be a key part of winning, but he's not a guy, he doesn't operate like some of these other top level five stars. He checks a lot of those boxes that, you know, that coach Pope talked about in his presser and said, you know, we want guys that understand what it means to play here without the, you know, without the foundation of all a bunch of guys at his same position that kind of feel like a drawback to wanting to play here in the first place. So you kind of got rid of coach Cal that, that that was obviously an appeal, but you got rid of that core roster that kind of dissuaded Liam from being here in the first place. So now it becomes a pretty appealing situation for a guy like Liam McNeely where it's unfortunate because this staff is so far behind some of the others that he is already in such deep conversations with and know what the vision looks like. They have a full coaching staff, all that, but it's still Kentucky and it's a a clean slate completely. You could see where a guy like Liam McNeely would go, man, that's a pretty appealing situation. It just sucks that his main Kentucky's main competition there is UConn, and UConn is also a pretty clean slate, and they have more recent tangible postseason success under the same coach. So they have, in terms of kind of some of the values of that he's looking for, UConn has the upper leg, but you know that's that at least gives Kentucky something something to hang on if you really do feel like Liam's your guy, and I think he's worth the challenge. I think he's worth the you know worth the push. Boogie Flan was very, very close with him in high school. They they talked extensively about playing together at Indiana. Boogie wanted to be for play for a blue blood, ended up signing at Kentucky. Does that change anything with Boogie Flan? He's a guy that he was the last to break off his letter of intent with Kentucky. Does that make him go, man, you know what? I already got pretty comfortable with Lexington. I don't want to go to Fayetteville. Maybe that this is a good fit for me. All those things are early conversations, but Liam is a really nice core guy that we talked about that is looking for some of the same things that that Mark is looking at. I hope I hope that is a very, very top priority for Mark as he kind of weighs his options and what what it looks like to build that foundation. Yeah, even when we had all the freshmen and Cal, and I was saying you can't win with seven freshmen and we already have guys at that small forward position. I still kind of wanted Liam McNeely. And again, this is before any of the Cal things. This isn't like just hindsight, trying to spin zone, whatever. I said Liam McNeely could be the best freshman out of that group. I like him way more than Travis and Samto and Billy and Carter. And I probably like him a smidge more than Boogie Fland. And I like the two years of Jaden Quaintance more. But if we're comparing freshman years, I probably like Liam McNeely just to be a step more college basketball ready year one. Um, so the fact that we don't have any of the freshmen anymore, and again, you have a veteran roster that could be filled with shooters, I think he's the perfect fit in the middle. It also would check one more box for Mark Pope. It's like, we can bring in a five-star freshman. Like, What would just the narrative be if, yes, you know you can get these multi-year guys, you can run just a really good X's and O's scheme, you have all like the, the coaching check boxes, but can you get the recruiting one? If you get a five-star like Liam McNeely to come in year one and you find success with him, let's say you go on a little bit of a tournament run or at least have relatively good, a relatively good season relative to the expectations of a brand new coach coming after 15 years of John Calipari and Liam McNeely is a top 20 pick, then you're saying like, oh, well, okay, 2025 class, which is going to be stacked. 
Let's go hit the portal again. Let's try to return a couple guys. Let, but let's pick our one to two freshmen that we just absolutely cannot miss out of that 2025 class and say, you're our guys. You can be like Liam last year. We're going to give you a good surrounding class. You're going to be the freshman star that's right in the middle of it. And again, just one to two guys. And I, I think they could set a really good foundation for the next several years of Coach Pope. I completely agree. And I think it was so crucial that – you got Colin Chandler to be the first commitment because this is a consensus top 40 guy who had his own very unique circumstances. Uh, you know, two, two years on mission started at Sierra Leone, ended up in London is now on his way back May 2nd. Uh, I was told somebody close to the BYU program that it is a six to eight week, um, ramp up pro process to get him back in game shape. Um, that it's something, I mean, there were more guys on this last year's BYU roster that had gone on a uh, on a two year mission and had come come back and played for this BYU team then that didn't so they know how to do this they know how that process looks like kind of the the grind that it takes to get these kids back from not playing competitive basketball for two seasons so i understand some of those concerns but i also know that there is a nice little sample size of them doing it in, in the past as recently as this past year's roster so um it's good to get a top 40 recruit to kind of get that started of, hey, Mark Pope lands four-star top 40 recruit is a really nice headline that he can kind of hang on to. It's a layup because he was already signed there, was already planning on being playing for Mark Pope this season anyway. But Liam McNeely would, would kind of fit the same billing. A McDonald's All-American, a guy that you know has some of the same fit things that Mark Pope is looking for. <laughs> You got to start somewhere. You got to land your first five star. You got to land your first burger boy. He brought that up intentionally during his presser. We are still going to be recruiting one and dones. We want to recruit the best of the best. It's not going to be just one and done 17 year olds. We want to have find that nice little uh, balance of young youth versus experience. And the cool thing about a borderline burger boy and uh, Colin Chandler, also, I don't like that the only two people that we have on the roster right now are both have first names as last names. We just have, like our whole roster right now is just four first names, Travis Perry and Colin Chandler. I keep wanting to call him Chandler Colin, so I need <laughs> to correct myself. But the good thing about Colin Chandler is, yeah, he's a freshman, but he's 20 years old. <laughs> so I, I get the caveat of he hasn't played basketball, at, at least maybe not as competitively as you would like in a couple of years. But you're bringing in a guy that's 20 years old. So even though you have a freshman, a top 30, a former top 30 recruit, you're still having age on your roster. So again, you put in a Liam McNeely, he will be the only young guy on the team with Travis Perry. I hope that's an okay assumption to make that Perry is back. Yeah, uh, and it is. Um, it, he was actually there at the press conference, and it was pretty mm -hmm. fascinating that uh, it, I was standing there talking to him. Mark Pope told him that he better get his shoulder loose because he's going to be getting a lot of shots up at Kentucky, which is an awesome, awesome thing. Um, but, yeah, the, it's a nice little one-two punch uh, between Colin Chandler and Travis Perry. But uh, while we were kind of dancing around the name itself, Matt put out on on Twitter, we'd already talked about it extensively on KS Board. So if you're not subscribed there, you're missing out. Um, Cody Figer of BYU will be the first assistant coach for Kentucky under Mark Pope. Um, it's an unbelievable hire. I, I've heard – really really good things that he was kind of the the anchor in the ca the the catalyst to a lot of the offensive changes and approach they went from a top 100 ish offense uh in in a year ago to a top 20 offense and one of the most exciting teams in college basketball a big part of that is because cody feiger was the team's offensive coordinator if you will um Right-hand man has been with him since 2013, as well-respected as an assistant, as you will find nationally. I'm a huge, huge fan of, of him and his approach and what he does for helping Mark Pope's offensive philosophy. So uh, home run, first first hire, that was always the expectation. There was no chance that this staff was not going to include Fo Cody Figer, but now uh, it is in the process of being made official uh, publicly. I'm st we're still waiting for the UK announcement, but... It's be being leaked that it is it is done deal Holyfield. I forget that the biggest media member 
in BBN shares the same first name as me. You said Matt put out a tweet confirming this. I was like, I, I don't remember doing <laughs> Good that. Good job, buddy. I'm proud to not hear that, but yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the other thing, the second paragraph in that Matt Jones tweet is he's the guy that's also starting to help um, Coach Pope recruit some guys. So I've seen a lot of tweets um, just like, Kentucky's staff has reached out to this guy. I was like, staff? Like, is it not just Coach Mark Pope right now? Like, do we have multiple guys? So it's good that we have a couple guys semi-officially on board reaching out to guys. Again, we talked about what are the dominoes that could start falling. Get your right-hand man in, fill out the rest of the staff, and then start putting a team together. Great first step in the right direction, not even an hour after we talked about these dominoes starting to fall. Yep, uh, we'll we'll see about the rest of the names and what that looks like. Uh, as things are still getting finalized, and it's it's going to be a process. Everybody, just be patient. But I like the I like the foundation. I like the the core beliefs that Mark Pope has. He talked extensively about like his offensive approach. Listening to him talk for an hour on radio Monday night was the most refreshing thing. We have not heard that level of transparency and um, you know teaching that. I think is really cool that we've missed that. And instead of just being told to go refill your popcorn bucket bucket and sit in the stands and enjoy the show, he wants you to be a part of it and learn what he's doing with him. And I think that's really important. And part of what we talked about to start the show, just how he gets it. Um, He talked about his offensive philosophy and how, uh, you know, he has watched the game progress from the 1990s where it was, you know, the shacks of the world, you, toss it inside and everybody else, you know, what we saw with Oscar, essentially everybody else sit back and watch while, you know, Shaq destroyed humanity. And then it kind of transitioned to a lot of pick and roll stuff and a lot of, you know, moving off the dribble and things like that. And now it's all about off ball movement and different actions and creating three and four different actions and single possessions. He's at the forefront of all that. He talked about that where it's like, I, I I'm a student of the game. I love dissecting the the trajectory of college basketball and how offensive th- offenses thrive and I want to be a part of it a, a part of that I want to be at the forefront of that and I want my team to be entertaining I want my team to dominate he you know I I want to you know invoke fear in a oppo- you know opposing defenses where they go I don't even know where the hell to begin he said I I enjoy that I crave that and that's what you want you want a guy that's hungry and wants to you know keep moving a program forward and never gets content so I think philosophically he's nailing all of those uh th- those little little details as well not only on the offense but the thing that I love to hear on the defense is which is not his strong suit but that he's willing to mix things up mid game like if something isn't working they have multiple preparations of other things that they can go to I think he called it a a kill or something along the lines of that, or just something that you can punch, throw at the other punch. A punch. Yes. Throw a punch for just one possession. Like the defense is used to man to man for eight straight possessions or the f- entire first half. And then here's a random zone or here's a random whatever that you can throw in. Um, instead of just having Texas A&M pick and roll you to death and running the same drop coverage with you got on Yenzo 40 times in a row and expecting a different result. Um, I'm not angry about that or anything. But <laughs> I, I, again, if defense isn't your strong suit, which it is, is not, um, I'm at least glad that he's willing to mix it up. And if, if it's not what you're best at, you're at least going to make offenses uncomfortable um, to offset that a little bit. And, and he talked about that. And I thought it was really cool talking about his defensive philosophy where he said, we kind of had a Tony Bennett approach where we were very much what you see is what you get with us, but it wasn't, a ton of production in that way. Like they were a very, kind of a below average, you know, Tony Bennett's Virginia and their slow molasses pace, but they're, you know, known for being high level, you know, defense and know, knowing exactly what you're going to get with them every time. He wanted that approach initially, but then realized, well, we don't really have the defensive chops in the personnel to be that way. And it kind of, it's kind of a losing strategy. So, why not shift into a high risk, high reward approach where we're still, you know, you, you know, we're going to come with the, you know, with the, the intensity, but we're going to take more chances because we, we have to compensate for personnel. I think that's, it's, he wants, again, he's always to be, always wants to be a step ahead of the game. And that's so important where, uh, let me, let me get the exact quote. He said, it's a, a little bit high risk, high reward. I guess I'll start before that. We're talking about the punches thing. He said, what we found over time is that we started to find little spaces in the game where we could change it up as we kind of read the data. 
a new thing that we didn't get a whole bunch of in the previous administration. Uh, how of how it was functioning for us, we thought it if we skillfully took opportunities, we call them punches, like a punch after a timeout or a punch after a dead ball, or actually sometimes a punch in live play where we give a drastically different look. Sometimes it can force teams to be a little bit on their heels where you're not going to get their most aggressive posturing. It's a little bit high risk, high reward, but I feel like we've found a real pulse on it where we're comfortable with it. We actually chart where we're able to keep teams off balance and how many possessions we feel like that's a, there's a lasting effect, even just from a, a one punch possession. Uh, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can distract teams from kind of just being downhill all the time. In-game strategy, in-game adjustments, little things that we're like, how are we watching Aaron Bradshaw get pummeled into uh, the, the cushion behind the basket 30 times a game? How is this happening? How do, how do we see this over and over again? Aaron Bradshaw in the stanchion, Z just lost and out of position. And Aaron, you know, how do we see the same mistakes over and over again? And then you have a guy admitting we might not be the most – fundamentally sound defense, but we're going to attack you where we know we can find vulnerabilities. That's exactly what I think this fan base is, is was hoping for last year with a similar offensive approach. I think that's going to be something that's very refreshing uh, for, for fans to enjoy this upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of talked about like coach Pope wanting fans to be a part of this and learn from this. And I've always kind of been under the coach Cal mentality of like, I want to leave all that to the coaches. I just want to go to games and just scream my lungs out and have fun and just make it as rowdy as an environment as possible every single time. Um, but I, I'm at least glad that our, our coach is open to the fans that do want to understand what we're doing and do have just like, why are we doing this over and over again? It does not make sense. And instead of just like, well, that's how you do it, you basketball Benny. It's kind of just a little more. Oh, I love that. There, there's reasoning behind it. There's intention. I think that's the biggest thing. There is intention behind almost everything that Mark Pope does. And a lot of the times it's just kind of like, all right, I trust Cal. He's my coach. He's my favorite coach ever. Um, I guess we'll let's just hope the results speak for themselves. But it does not feel like there is a lot of intentionality within just our organization as a whole the past three years it's like is are this is this year is this what we're going to try to be doing like what's the identity of kentucky basketball and i feel like that's the big thing under mark pope after he gets this roster together i feel like we're finally going to have an identity of this is what you expect when you play kentucky basketball they're going to mix it up a lot but you know that they're going to play good offense they're going to shoot the three they're going to make things so uncomfortable for you on both sides of the ball and hopefully they're going to win a lot of basketball games very excited for it. This has been an absolute blast. Before we get out of here, um, give me your the one thing you're most confident in in the Mark Pope era, um, considering what we've seen the last 72 hours since he's been announced, uh, and the one major concern you have about how uh, about the Mark Pope era and, and the trajectory of the program. Again, when I say most confident, it's and even least confident. It's very relative because I can't say with any certainty of – What's going to happen? I, I just think for I, I think what I'm most confident is again, there's going to be intentionality. I think we have a coach that is going to look into the analytics, understand what's happening in modern basketball, and they're going to adapt to it and they're going to put our players in the best position to do what they need to do every year. And you know what? We're going to miss some talent evaluations. We're going to have we're going to lose some games. We're going to have some good, bad, um, just coaching plays or whatever. But I feel like more often or not, when we say Kentucky basketball had a bad season or Kentucky basketball even just lost a game, we're not going to be like, we did it because of coaching malpractice. It's not all the pieces were there, but we just refused to do this or we didn't do this or we did all of this, but we did it way too much. And we, I just think Mark Pope is going to put Kentucky basketball in a position to succeed more often than not. And when you're at a premier program like Kentucky, I really think that's all you can ask for because it's Kentucky. Like there's in our last seven coaches, the only two people that didn't win championships had their own problems. So I, I think he can put ourselves in a really good position to win another championship. The thing that I am still uncertain about is how complete of a roster he can build. Um, again, I think he'll get guys. I think he'll guys get guys that fit his system, but kind of like we said, defense has never been a really strong suit for him. 
Um, it seemed like he didn't like some of the guys that were currently on the roster or in our recruiting class. And I'm like, hey, I kind of like those guys. Like, what what are you seeing that you don't like? Is it because of their basketball play? Because I feel like their basketball play could add things. Um, so, like, are we going to go into the season and be like, whoa, we don't have any defensive players. We got all these three-point shooting wings, but we don't have any defensive players. Or, I, I think another thing is, can he get a star? Because, again, you could run a great offense. You could have the great X's and O's. Game on the line, Final Four, do you have an Aaron Harrison that can make the shot? Do you have an Anthony Davis that can get the defensive stop? Can you get a game changer on, yes, we can build a great team. It's cohesive. All things go together. Can you get a guy that's going to make the winning play? So that that's probably my one concern. But, again, it, it's all relative. I am so much uncertainty about the Mark Pope era other than just it's been a lot of fun for the first, what has it been, five days, five and a half days? Five, yeah, set three days since the public introduction and five days since the announcement itself. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say my m- biggest level of confidence in him and the reason why I feel really good about this working is because the platform sells itself. It is a, you know, you don't have to be the most brilliant mass basketball mastermind the the greatest recruiter to ever live to be successful at Kentucky the job has such a high floor because of all the resources all of the you know the the national spotlight all of those little things it the job kind of does itself for you you just have to be able to be the captain of the ship you just have to be able to ride the waves well and know how to press the right buttons with this fan base to keep the momentum moving forward that's what john calipari failed at in recent years and that's why he said so eloquently that this program needed a new voice because it did i i think the most the confidence that that I have in Mark Pope is that he understands that and knows that he kind of has a really, it's a really cushy gig. If you can kind of battle some of the PR stuff, if you can handle the spotlight and not let it swallow you whole the way it did for Billy Gillespie and, you know, different smaller examples uh, over the years, you're going to be fine. He has the, the X's and O chops that, oh, that compensate a little bit for the lack of recruiting expertise. And that's part of the reason why he needs to add some recruiting help on the staff and all that. But he's got a really nice foundation that makes me believe that it's going to take a lot for him to fail here. He's going to have to get dudes and can't recruit like he's recruiting to BYU. And looking at some of the portal guys that he's recruiting right now seems to indicate that he gets that getting a guy like Liam McNeely would, would confirm that for me. So I think it's a really high floor job and he's a guy that can kind of take you to the next level because of his passion and because of, you know, those things. Um, if you're looking for my biggest concern, it is just kind of the, the beginning of this and getting off on the right foot with finding the right pieces on the staff and getting the core group together for the roster and fielding a competitive roster to not, you know, it's a high floor. If you, you you can press the right buttons and he's done that so far for uh from a PR perspective but can he do it from an actual personnel level that remains to be seen and it's something that we should find in short order but we still got to see it so um got to be patient got to see how these next few days and weeks go um, i'm excited to follow him on like the EYBL trail and see what like who he looks at what events he goes to? Is he just going to be a be at every single Nike event like Cal and Orlando and you know the rest of his staff, or is he going to be the guy that hits Under Armour and Adidas and hit some of the smaller events? Puma has one now. Like go hit some of these smaller events and try to find the diamonds in the rough, or is he just going to go get his five stars? Not just go from the top of the list at number one and work his way down the top ten, but find his okay. I like fourteen better than eight. I like. 22 better than 14 i i'm excited to see kind of how he processes those things and that all remains to be seen but uh a lot to be excited matt this has been an absolute blast i believe i have one ad to do before we get out yeah um source say podcast is brought to you by andy ludicky my perfect franchise.net andy is a franchise consultant as well as franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets financial requirements time to commit and more his services are 100 free and he is here to help if you have any questions about business ownership you can learn more and contact andy anytime at www.myperfectfranchise.net 
Net. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. I know it was last second. We tried to fit this into a very tiny window and we made it work to perfection. So I appreciate you doing this and uh, great stuff as always. You are an absolute treat. Hey, I appreciate it. And I really appreciate you having me on. I mean, it sources say has like been my favorite podcast to listen to for like the past, what, five, six years now, however long you've been doing it. I've been a huge fan. Um, so to come on, it's been an absolute honor, but it's also been really cool. I think there was a comment in the chat. It said like Matt Sack is literally every fan talking to the guy we went all the answers from right now. <laughs> like what? Just I'm so used to just screaming at the like YouTube, which is like, Jack, please talk about this guy. Please talk about this guy. Like now I just have the opportunity. It's like, well, Jack, we are going to talk about this guy. I'm just going to bring him up. So it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. Well, uh, let uh, let fans know where they can find your work, uh, you know, written work, uh, talking work, Twitter work, all that fun stuff. So my written work is in the form of 280 character tweets. You could find me at <laughs> Matt Sack, R2NG on Twitter. And you can hear my listening work at the Rup to No Good podcast. Find it wherever you listen to your podcast, except for YouTube. We're not that cool like Jack is here. Uh, but yeah, Matt Sack, R2NG on Twitter and Rup to No Good on uh, your streaming platforms. You can find me on Twitter as well at Jack Pilgrim KSR. Go subscribe to KSR+. Plus. Just just surpassed 5,000 subscribers over there. So it's been a lot. We're having a blast. It's overwhelming, but it is the place to be, the latest and greatest info. Who is Kentucky reaching out to? Who is Mark Pope hiring? All that fun stuff. You will find it there first and foremost. So make sure you go subscribe there. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. Appreciate everybody joining us. It's been a heck of a ride the last couple of weeks. Appreciate you kind of riding the waves with us. Uh, and thank you for Matt Sack for joining us this afternoon on such short notice. He did a great job and we will have him back on very soon. Also, shout out Steven for getting the show started on a very, very high uh, high note and got the emotional attachment that we needed because uh, he is our uh, our uh, resident diehard. So appreciate him and appreciate each and every one of you. We will see you next time.